Hello, welcome to this special University of Brighton podcast. I'm Richard Newman. In this episode, we're going to talk about doing a PhD and especially completing one at Brighton. But for many, it's seen as quite intimidating, even though any of our graduates could potentially do one. So in this podcast, we're going to do a bit of myth busting and make the information as accessible as possible for you. So we've assembled an expert panel to talk about this. Firstly, final year PhD student Adora Udachukwu, based in the School of Environment and Technology. Then there's Dr. Yanis Pantelidis, Director of Doctoral Studies, Dr. Adesi Okoye, PhD Supervisor with the Law Group, and Dr. Kay Aranda, Research Coordinator for the School of Health Sciences. So let's start with you, Yanis. Why should people think about doing a PhD? Because you believe this is probably a good period to do one. This could be a, a time where you can reflect as to what you want to do in the future. And if what you want to do in the future has to do with either advanced consultancy or you want to get into a research role or you might want to become an academic, this would be a good time to consider a doctorate level of study. Also, uh, this is the second year, I think, where you have loans. So financially, it makes it a little bit easier than perhaps when we studied uh, for a PhD, when we, I, I self-financed myself for my PhD. Uh, but the real reason has to come from you. The real reason why you want to do a PhD has to be you. And it shouldn't be because you want to learn more about a subject. Let's be honest about that. It should, because a PhD is not about just about learning something. It's about contributing to the body of knowledge. So you got to think that at the end of it, you'll be a real expert in your field of study. Um, and, and everything else is connected to that, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, Adora, as someone that is studying now, do you want to quickly take us through what it is you're doing now? Um, and, and just tell us why you decided to do that. Um, you mean why I decided to do the PhD? Yeah, and, 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 what it is you're, what, and, and what it is you're doing at the moment as well, what you're focusing on. Uh, so at the moment, I'm trying to do the right of face. Uh, I've done pretty much most of the work, uh, but because of the pandemic, there's been a lag. So I'm sort of like rewriting my whole thesis. So this is just writing and reflection stage. And the reason why I did the PhD was I was coming from industry, many few years of experience, and I wanted something different. I'd done a master's, I'd gone back to study a master's in environment, and I was looking for expertise uh, in that field. And I was also with a vision of becoming like a consultant uh, in environmental management and science. So I decided to do a PhD in environment at Brighton uh, to support that. I want to get your opinions um, to the, to a lot of you about the fact that you know it's this is something that anyone can do that's you know, come through postgraduate study. Um, okay, starting with you, do you think there's a sort of elitist approach to a doctorate externally, which hopefully this podcast will do a job to bring that down to earth a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I should say that most of the um, students that I meet and work with are coming from healthcare. So they have a particular understanding of the role of research in clinical practice or in community health. And sometimes that can make the doing of practice can feel disconnected from understanding and researching that practice. Um, so I do think sometimes there's a little less confidence about how you start to think about maybe building on your postgraduate master's dissertation into a piece of PhD work. Um, I should say this year, more than any other year, though, the health service is actively researching, you know, the full impact of COVID, not just for inpatients, not just in critical care, but looking at the whole sort of service pathway from community primary care uh, and back again, and then more, you know, concerning what people are living with in terms of long term COVID. Um, so it's been, if ever there was a time to come and do PhD research, it would be now because that, that impact is not going to go away at any time. But yes, I do think there's some stereotypes around. So trying to debunk some of that, making people realise that they possibly have transferable skills and knowledge and experience already. And that the very thing that they experience in practice, if they've left and gone back out into practice, 
um, things they're struggling with, things they don't know yet are the very sort of, you know, seeds of a PhD that they can grow with some advice and some support. What are your thoughts on that, Daisy? Um, I think you need a, a healthy dose of intellectual curiosity. So mm -hmm. you, if you have a curious mind, um, we're looking at questions that are important, interesting, relevant, um, gaps. Uh, and you probably come across this and you think, why hasn't someone else done it? You could be that person. Mm -hmm. And then if you marry that with uh, good guidance from a supervisor and you put in some good hard work and you feel you're capable of communicating properly and writing quite well and you then go on to learn some of the other skills along the process I think you're well on your way so you can do it um, but it, it is I understand daunting at first but quite for everyone if I was able to do it then people will be able to do it as well so I think this is the thing, really. We want to go through answering some of these questions, which are, I guess, some of the basics, which I think some of the basics may be some of the most difficult questions to ask, to answer sometimes. So let's start with something very, very general. People, a lot of people are, uh, are put off by how long it might take to complete this. What sort of timescales are we looking at, potentially, from quickest to longest? It, it's a marathon. You got to see it as a marathon. <laughs> uh, the, the quickest you can technically do it is three years as a full time. Uh, the longest you can do it depends on the regulations of each university. But let's say on average, a part time student might take about six to seven years. The reality of a PhD is that very rarely a student will finish in exactly three years, even a full-time student, they will take a bit longer. The, the shortest I have seen it for a part-time was four and a half or four years uh, by a, a, a colleague who was super organized, super focused, and she could manage her, her work. She, she was a consultant, so she could reduce the projects you would take on to focus on the PhD. And she treated the PhD um, like a full-time job, uh, which is what we tell our students, but not many, many, many listen. So you, you can finish it uh, mm -hmm. relatively quick, but you have to keep in mind that it's a long-term investment of time and money. So if you're not willing uh, to, and you're not curious, you don't have the intellectual curiosity that Adaeze was saying, that will sustain you throughout, and especially the middle part of your PhD. That's the hardest part where you are suffering those doubts uh, about what have I been doing with my life and will I ever see this through? And then you reach you know, the end point where you can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, you do the final push. Um, and, and it's the, the one thing I will say from my personal experience as PhD, it's, and I always say, do what I say, don't do what I did, is don't take long pauses. I, if you're a part-time student, especially, I took, I, because of work, I took uh, you know, quite lengthy times of six months of not touching it. So then I would do two steps back, you know, three steps forward, two steps back. And it took me, it took me seven years to do mine. So not very proud of that, but <laughs> there you go. At the same, at the same time, um, we, we, you know, so many people will want to be take doing this, doing a PhD around their life and their work. So you, there might be some people that are working full time and then they're trying to do a PhD around it. They might have family commitments. They might have caring commitments as well. So actually it's one of the main benefits of this, uh, K the, the fact that it can be pretty flexible actually you 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 complete this in your own time when you're ready i think so I, mm. yeah i think because again uh, just related to health science students we have many more part-time students that are exactly that they're often mid-career they're often coming to us to undertake phd when they do have those family commitments and other commitments um we often talk about having to get your whole family on board um because obviously it's part and parcel of your whole life and sometimes the, the employing trust uh, might be more flexible and support them with time away. Other times they have to squeeze that in quite often to weekends, which is, you know, again, your own time. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's just that flexibility is great because it allows them to carry on working and many part-time students welcome that. Um, I think sometimes they feel a little bit disconnected from us as a community, which we're making you know, great attempts to overcome because it is, I did my PhD part-time, so I know how it feels when you're full-time, you're fully, it seems like you're fully immersed in the culture of that community. So you can feel like you're missing out on something, but this way of working that we've all had to learn very fast this year has meant that we've been able to connect and communicate with part-time students in a way like we haven't probably done so successfully previously. Mm. We'll so I think the... they welcome that. They welcome being able to dip in and dip out. Yeah. Um, and this remote way of supervising or connecting with them has been, yeah, it's been a real bonus. Mm. I think we'll come to how maybe these this last year as... Um, difficult as it has been may actually contribute to some positives going forward um, a little bit later in the podcast. Um, Adora, what's your, um, how have you found it? What sort of intensity are you working at um, to, to complete this? Are you, do you doing other things on the side or are you attacking this full time? I'm going to get this done now. Um, at the moment, I mean, I try not to um, just, be immersed in the PhD, even though, I mean, some people work differently. So for mm. me, right from the beginning, I always understood that I can never work under pressure. So I need to space out my time. So I actually do other things. I do a lot of um, uh, engaging things in the university, like student engagement, student support. I do so many things to compartmentalize my day and my week. Uh, because I only have a short amount of time that I am um, engaged in the PhD and I try to also do other things because I was coming from industry I've not been in research for a long time so it was difficult for me to transition back to learning even basic things like you know using Excel or any of this software so it, it took me a longer time and so I try to do other things I try to have a social life uh, because in the first two years, it was quite isolating. And I had to deliberately work out something to keep me engaged. Uh, and just doing the PhD in and out, because that's what I was doing in the first two years, didn't work for me. Uh, so now that I've spaced out everything, I have time for this, I have time that I study, I have time that I just rest. Uh, it's been working more at my own pace. And luckily, I've got supervisors who also um, kind of like ring it in your ear that you have to manage your well-being because I also had a lot of challenges with my well-being and my health during the period. So for me, it's working at my own pace and, you know, rewarding myself when I think I deserve it. I think I want to come back to that a little bit later about well-being support um, for sure. Um, Daisy, I just want to touch upon... Um, what Adora said there about how you know a lot of people may be coming into studying a PhD actually having not done much research for a number of years they maybe haven't been a student for a number of years so they started trying to reacclimatize themselves with that kind of with that kind of way of working um, how much does a supervisor really need to understand that um, when they come when you first start advising them and working with them it's important. It's important. And usually the supervisor would know the background. Uh, they would try to understand the student. Um, and what then happens is they probably would recommend a number of workshops. So um, although uh, students are, or the, the PhD research is independent, there are a number of workshops at the start recommended for skill sets uh, and for skills. And through with the PhDs in law as well, we try to get students to, when they can attend uh, conferences or poster sessions or um, seminars, so that from time to time they can um, have a rubbing of minds or talk to other sorts of students and um, begin to have a loose community. So yes, we do bear that in mind that 
people come back to PhD research from different sorts of industries or continue on as students. However, they need to understand um, the nature of PhD research because it's intense and it needs a particular skill set, but it can be learned mm. and the supervisor helps in guiding that process. Right. Okay. So next stage decided. Yeah. Okay. Want to do a PhD. What do I do next? What, how, how do you start? And how do you find a supervisor? Where do the conversations begin? Shall, shall I start again? Okay. Um, the, the, as I'm, I'm going back to, to the thing that I said about passion and the area that you're passionate about. So I'm assuming now that you have done your undergraduate degree and you've done your master's perhaps. There are some cases where you can go for a PhD straight from an undergraduate, but, but let's focus on the more traditional one. So you had a chance to study and test your academic skills and maybe you have an area where you think, you know, I really like this particular area. Now the key is to say, okay, where is the a potential gap? Can I visualize a gap in the literature where I can contribute? So just to make it more, more, more specific, let's say that, I don't know, consumer behavior is the theory where you enjoy, your, you want to understand how consumers uh, sort of interact in a very particular context. So you take the, the theory and the context and then you start reading as much as you can about that. And then you think, ah, I found this context or these two theories, maybe there's a gap there where I can investigate more. So your next step would be to say, okay, I'll, I'll start putting some thoughts together, putting a, what we call the proposal or the early stages of a proposal. And then I'm going to look for experts around the subject area. Who are the people that might be able to help? And by doing this simple, you know, just normal search online to find other experts who are writing, you know, from your reading, you will see who wrote articles relevant to your research. You start thinking, okay, here's a couple of experts and maybe this is the university where I want to study. If you've studied at that particular university, if we take University of Brighton as an example, you have an added advantage. The added advantage of being inside, knowing the people that you studied you know, and being able to talk to them before you even graduate from, let's say, your, your master's degree. Uh, you have access, in other words. If you don't have access, you have to do the search. Find, find individuals who might be able to help. And with this early proposal, I always recommend structure a really nice email. Uh, make, make sure you research and you don't spell the name of the person you're writing to wrongly. Uh, make sure you don't send your proposal to somebody who you think, I'll give you an example. I've, I've had emails from people wanting me to supervise their uh, research in hospital management. Yeah, but this comes from a cultural background. They don't understand the difference between hospitality, which is the context of where I research, versus hospital management. So don't make those basic mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if you hear back from one or two of these individuals, that means they are, they are allowing you to be accessible. And you start the conversation, you start the dialogue, and it could take weeks, it could take months, it could take years before you actually engage and start the, the, the PhD. So don't take your time so you're certain this is what you want to do. Don't rush it. A lot of people rush it and then they find out that that maybe wasn't what they really wanted to do. I could go I, on forever. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess you could because you're not just looking for um, an expert. You're looking for someone to guide you through a process for a very long time. So you need to mm -hmm. clearly have uh, a good attachment on a, on a personal level. Do you hear Daisy? I think uh, there have been two approaches. So some have come direct to the supervisor, but also at Brighton, some have come through the doctoral college. Um, some have said, I think I want to do this at Brighton. I know Brighton will have this skill set. And so they approach the doctoral college and the doctoral college then approaches a supervisor. But either way, you get to a point where you then have that personal contact. And that supervisor would read uh, the proposal um, uh, or the proposal draft 
and uh, there will be the opportunity to speak to the candidates, um, to, to talk to them about their interests, uh, about why they want to do it, about um, what they see as the project and whether that reflects, you know, the gap and whether the gap actually exists. So, yes, there is a relationship, yes, that eventually de develops. Because mm. I guess as a supervisor as well, Kay, you need to, do you kind of need to be interested in it yourself you need to have an investment the supervisor first to have an investment in it as well but i'm also wondering um as a on a flip side to that because researchers are um experts in their field and then you have someone coming to you with a proposal of a gap in your area do supervisors almost need to leave a bit of ego at the door when they're taking on a, a phd student sometimes that happens sometimes. I'm just wondering whether you can see that. I think. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think any one supervisor can be everything to any well, uh, one candidate or PG, you know, postgraduate researcher, as we um, um, we call doctoral students at the University of Brighton. Um, I think it comes with all of that relationship that's been spoken mm. about, as well as um, recognizing where your own limits are. What the particular project needs in terms of and that would be around it could be around theory it could be around methodology it could be around the expertise in empirically researching that area and you try to build a team that meets those needs and so quite often we'll look we normally have two supervisors on a team because that is often the balance and that those needs can be met within that balance but sometimes we have three um, and sometimes when students are working on their um, doctorates, they sometimes will come across a specialist area. So we will reach out to other colleagues that we know across the university that might have that specialist knowledge. Um, not that they become a supervisor, but there's other resource that we can tap into, um, partly because of the way we've organised our research um, as well. So we have centres for research um, excellence and enterprise and excellence um, so we know there are colleagues across the university wanting to focus on particular areas so it's a great resource as you know as well as having a dedicated team that you meet with yeah um, uh, so adora how did you approach your supervisor what was your journey uh for me it was quite different because i i had interest so I, I just finished the job then and i had some I thought I was interested in sustainability and co-innovation, which is not what I'm doing now. And I started running with that thought. On the other hand, I was very obsessed with green space as a hobby, so, which is what I'm doing now. So it was, I was thinking with the idea, I just finished this master's, I just had this one year experience in this amazing company. I want to do something in innovation. I didn't know how to write a proposal, Googled online, I knew I wanted to do a PhD, I knew I wanted to be a professional, just found some sort of like draft proposal, spare writing. But it was until after sending 50 emails, looking randomly at universities, didn't get much response. I got a couple of feedback, some gave me extra work, oh, you need to do this, do this, do this, write it to suit us. And then I started thinking, you know, I thought, do I really want to do this uh, innovation thing? Because I had spent Days just writing emails that some were never replied uh, to these lecturers and different people were just Googling their work online. And it was not until I met with somebody else in France. Uh, she, she was uh, working on uh, biodiversity green space in uh, map, uh, UNESCO map. And I don't know, I met her in a conference and I was just talking about how I wanted to do a PhD. And she then started asking me my interest. So, I started having these meetings we had. So she actually gave me, the first time she gave me some journals to read. And I was like, okay. She said, she then taught me how to write a proposal. So it was based on this proposal I developed with her. Uh, she was uh, an assistant professor in uh, CNS uh, France. Then I started resending again, but this time around, I already had a proposal that was actually targeted to universities that were located in an area of study I was interested in in the UNESCO biosphere so I actually had eight universities and Brighton was one of them uh, so yes I just looked up uh, people who were doing anything and anything with nature I just started using keywords green spaces behaviors 
and then I came up with a couple of names. And out of the seven universities I sent to, I got four replies, and then it came down to funding before I chose the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, can I, Richard? I had one other uh, approach which we left out, and, and I think it's important that we say that there are a number of projects out there. That, that supervisory teams will together put a project that is funded. So if you have this yeah. interest area and passion and you say, I don't know, innovation or green spaces is, I'm interested in that, keep on looking for scholarships for specific projects. These projects have been predetermined uh, research aims and objectives. And, but if you're passionate about the area, then you can join this research team and, and you get a, quite often a fully funded uh, PhD it can happen that way as well. Mm. Um, so it, those, that's all really great advice. And I think the, the next stage then, um, <laughs> so we've done, so you've done a proposal, you found your institution that you might want to go and, uh, do your PhD with, you found your supervisor as well. And then it comes down to, um, money. So what are the funding options here? I, I don't, do you, are you going first again? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, do. uh, I, do. I just published a video yesterday about financing. <laughs> so, this is the, the big stuff. This is the big bit, though, isn't it? I mean, this is this this really is the bit where you, this is where the most questions uh, are going to come it's from. The challenge. This is the reason why people are listening to this podcast. <laughs> How do I fund it's, doing a PhD? It's the one I was procrastinating doing that video, and I did it, and I don't think I did it justice. Um, I, I split it in three parts and, and maybe colleagues and, and you know, Dora can help me here because if I'm missing things out, <laughs> I will then go and put it in comments in my, you know, my own video. But um, I, I split it into self-financing, number one, uh, then secondly, scholarships and studentships, and then three alternative sources of funding. The self-financing for me can happen uh, I'm looking at my own way of how I, how I did mine. I worked full time and I studied part time. So I paid it from, you know, making a living. I didn't, I didn't, I was already paying for my accommodation and living expenses. If you like, I have family. So all that was naturally covered. That's one way of self-financing. The other way of self-financing is the loan, which is very recent. If you go to .gov.uk, it explains the doctoral loans. And I think it's about 26 and a half thousand up to you can get. So when you like look at the uh, fees for a PhD in the UK, it's around four and a half thousand, which is standard four and a half thousand for EU, about 11 to 12,000 for an international student. So no matter what you are, you still have room to play with, you know, from the 26 K you can cover your accommodation or at least quite a chunk of your accommodation if you wanted to do it full time. The other area, which is the scholarships, we kind of mentioned it before that there are projects there. Uh, there, are, there are a number of, in the UK, we call them research councils, which fund specific projects, whether it's STEM subjects, whether it's social science, you've got different research councils that cover all these areas, whether it's the arts or health. Um, so look out for those. And, and look for the trends on when they advertise the scholarships. So you can be ready for the next cycle. So you can apply well in advance and be ready uh, to, to hit some of those scholarships. The other element of scholarships or studentships is when universities themselves offer, for example, our university every year, they offer two full international student, studentships. This year they've delayed announcing how many and how this might happen. But they also have the alumni scholarships, which you can get funding. If, if almost, I think it happens automatic this year. If you are, if you were an alumni of Brighton, you get up to two and a half thousand um, from your fees. So if you're mm -hmm. EU, UK, and it's four and a half thousand, your PhD only costs you two thousand in fees, which is quite a good deal, I think. Um, and then finally, it's the alternative sources of funding that people forget, which there are a number of charities out there that if you are doing a particular research project in an area, in a context, an industry, let's say, uh, there will be a charity for that industry that might want to support you because finding, uh, you know, the, the, the findings of your research might be very important to them. And, and you can get small pockets of money, but every little counts that can help you with with your research. At Brighton, we're also a member of the Alternative uh, Funding Guide, 
which uh, if you if you if you study with us, you can get access to that. It gives you over 500 charities uh, that can help with financing different types of PhDs. I'll pass on to colleagues because there might be areas that pretty comprehensive. I would only <laughs> sorry. Okay. I would just add to that because in in health and social care, if you're working in those settings. There are other, similar to the research councils, but they offer fully funded PhDs, so they'll do salary placement costs. They're very, very competitive. And there's a whole clinical academic pathway that builds into a PhD. Um, so it's, it's to be aware of that. Um, and there are some other options that are coming on board with that as well. So it's really worth contacting um, a potential supervisor and discussing those options as well. I know we have information on the website. Um, yeah, I'll just add that to what Yanis has said. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, what we've come down to is that we've, you've got, has to do a lot of research before you, before you can do the research um, in terms of where you can go, who's going to guide you through it and how you're going to fund it and, and how you're going to build your life around it. So um, questions, I guess, to Adora and also I'll come to you first to Daisy though. Uh, how do you, we've sort of touched upon it a little bit already, um, but how do you then, as a supervisor, support that student from a from a well being point of view as well? So we're not even talking from um, the actual research point of view. How do you help them when, I guess, that bit where Yanis was saying the middle bit, especially where it's getting especially tough, or if people are struggling a little bit to balance research and life and work, where does the supervisor come in there, and what does the University of Brighton do to help support them? I think the University of Brighton has the um, student support uh, and guidance uh, tutors who do an amazing job and work with the supervisors because supervisors um, are experts in their own field and they are able to listen to the student and especially handle struggles and uh, lull periods in the work. But sometimes there are other life issues um, uh, beyond that of the uh, expertise of the supervisor. And so the university network of support comes in, you know, very handy as well to draw along the uh, supervisor expertise and create this link so that if they need um, extra well-being support, then they have someone to talk to if they need um, periods um, of perhaps an interruption, there are right processes to follow. Um, and so the supervisor works hand in hand with all the other support networks which the university provides to ensure um, that that student is properly supported. So supervisor first point of contact, but there are other services that that um, postgraduate student will benefit from uh, because you do get the sense from my past students um, and current students that if you are not adequately supported in well-being it affects the work and it affects everything so it's important with the middle bit uh, which uh, Yanis was referring to it deals with any long-term project you get to a point where suddenly you think maybe this isn't what I want or maybe this is going on for too long or this is so difficult. You know, you start to sort of think, oh, I'm tired of this. But what then happens is this is where some of the networking in the academic sector, presenting your work to your fellow students, attending a conference, going for a poster thing, going for a workshop and having questions again that reignite your intellectual career, reignite, remind you of why you started this in the first place and help you overcome that period. Um, and I've seen that happen quite a lot where you then sort of get that interest again and say, yes, it's great. I will only redo this or redo that bit, but I'll keep going. So yes, there's a network as well as the supervisors. That's really well summarized, I think. But Adora, what do you, you think about um, in terms of your experiences? Well, from my experience, uh, I mean, if I look back, I think the supervisors have the training, but I don't necessarily think that every PhD student wants to talk to the supervisors always, mm -hmm. as there's so many issues to deal with. 
There's so many other things that you feel you can't share. I mean, when, when I struggle with things like specifically to do with the project, or maybe I, I talk to them, I, I, I always make sure to ex, ex, uh, let my supervisors updated on anything generally, if it's health, even if I feel they can't address it. But then again, I think a lot of PhD students, from my experience, and because I, I've communicated with a lot, uh, I think a lot we, we sort of need ourselves. So you need to have your support group. I've got my support group of international PhD students, but I had to make deliberate attempts to make that group or just, you know, go out of my way to meet people, uh, go out of my way to attend things. So I've got people that I've talked to. I've got people that I talk to for specific things. I've got people that I talk to when it's money struggles, whether it's a, something in my chapter or maybe an idea that I'm thinking of. I've got people that I go out with. And I think that really helps. And another thing that has helped me is not just having the group of community of KC students, not necessarily in my school, uh, it could be people in different faculties so because I, I go out of my way. But another thing is maybe because I'm, I've always been involved in a lot of things to do with the campus. So I was doing a lot of on-campus jobs. So it means I also know a lot of undergrad. A lot of PhD students might not necessarily want to deal with undergrads, but I'm one of those that have a lot of interaction with undergrads, even though uh, they're younger, they have fresh ideas. So I've even had chats about my PhD with undergrad students pick their brains. Um, I attend a lot of um, uh, on-campus uh, social activities and I also have like access to people in student support services. So randomly somehow when I'm struggling with anything a name just comes up in my head. I know this person might have information I need and that's just because I deliberately decided I wanted to be involved in the university fully. So it wasn't just about uh, my PhD, my group, it was just bigger. Yeah, it was just anything that was happening on campus, I was uh, aware. Yeah, and important uh, to realize so what you know, any, any student, yeah, whether you're whether you're an undergrad, postgrad, PhD student, you can be part of that university community. It doesn't make any difference. You can yeah. still join those, you know, societies and be all part of this of, of everything else. You can be part of the university. Um, before we finish, um, I want to talk about we're, we're gonna, uh, just going to get you, uh, Yanis, just to have a just to give us a little bit of information about how we can find out more about how to study at Brighton specifically and what sort of courses. And then while he's doing that, we all have a little think about what you wish that you knew before you started a PhD that you didn't, that you suddenly you got into your course and you went, God, I wish I knew that. And you can pass on someone else. So what you've all got a little bit of time to think about that while Yanis just tells us a bit more information about Brighton specifically. Uh, the, there is a very easy way to, to find everything about Brighton and PhDs and it's the the URL of uh, the university is brighton.ac.uk if you do forward slash PhD that will land you to the area all the pages about the different research centers where can you study how you can develop a proposal we even have an example of a proposal and a structure you can use and um, you can pretty much anything from uh, where do I find a potential supervisor all the way to, to how do I apply and finding the, the portal where, where you apply is all starts from the brighton.ac.uk forward slash PhD. If people have uh, questions about and specific questions, and I know that if you've been the first time in a website, it's very hard to, to navigate. Um, I've organized, uh, I've done a number of videos because I was getting so many questions from, uh, from potential applicants in all the open events we've been doing. Um, and I did a number of series of videos from why you shouldn't do a PhD all the way to the more, more recently how to finance uh, your PhD and in between how to find a supervisor and what have you. So if you go to blogs.brighton.ac.uk forward slash doctorate, uh, then you will get to this blog and on one of the links, I've got all the potential uh, frequently asked questions that I've been and other colleagues have been asked in events. And I've given you the links to every single question I've been asked to date. I cool. hope that's enough.
Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good starting point, I'm sure. Right. Let's rattle through this very quickly then. I just want to give you, if you give me all one point that you wish you knew, I think we'll start, we'll kick off with UK, please. I wish I'd known some of this <laughs> before I started and some of Adora's strategies, because I think finding where you want to do your work and finding people you feel like you can connect with that field or that body of scholarship that you might then end up contributing to is a really good point. A Daisy? The advice, particularly about narrowing and getting your area right, because a bit like Adora too, you often find that uh, I started out quite wide and then um, rambled through before I got to what I wanted to do. So doing some of the pre-work um, would, would have saved me time. Adora? Yeah, exactly what I was going to say. And in fact, I was going to specifically say, I wish I knew what a theoretical framework was, because it took me two years to discover. And it's, it's funny, I've just had a conversation with two PhD students in the second year, and I realized that they didn't really understand it. So I explained it, and I've had feedback from one of them saying, oh, wow, that was amazing, now I understand it. This is something I came in with wild ideas about, I was obsessed about green space, how this, lovely green spaces help but i didn't really know how to make the connection with uh, the academic frame mind so i came with, with so, so many ideas that looked interesting but it took me the first two years of changing my topic which can really slow you down uh, so i had to do a lot of changing and rewriting so i think if if people anyone who is in the phd just play around there's a lot of resources on youtube because i started to discover that there's a lot of um, professors who have explained it. And if I knew that, it could have helped me even with writing my proposal, because right from the first year, I would have had a very clear mind of where I was contributing to, uh, rather than discovering it in the second year. That's cool. um, <laughs> and one of those videos, of course, some of those videos you can see from our very own Yanis here as well. So we yeah. mentioned some of those, you can find those on, on YouTube. Yanis, just finally then, um, what, what would you, what do you wish you knew? I, I wish I could go back in time and tell myself not to, to uh, get too excited with all the other projects, because when you come to an academic community, there's so many areas you can research. So um, I finished a book in the middle of writing my PhD. <laughs> I'll, I, when I look back at what I did and why it took me so long, I, I, um, I would say to anyone who starts, once you're in, you're too excited to be in, you could uh drop a gear and procrastinate don't do that and keep focusing on your phd i wish somebody told me that don't take on too many projects mm -hmm. and be too hungry uh, because you need to finish that thing and then and then the world is your oyster i guess brilliant all four of you thank you so much for your time on this podcast your starting point if you are thinking about doing a phd is brighton.ac.uk forward slash phd I hope you found this useful. Thanks for listening.